So welcome everyone to this session organized for the crowd modeling community of practice. I'm Annabel Molero. I'm coordinating the crowd modeling community of practice. I'm very happy to have um, great speakers today for you. Um, this session is entitled Machine Learning and Crowd Modeling, a Modern Affair. And we have here Matthew Reynold, the leader of the crowd modeling community of practice, who is going to present the speakers. Matthew Reynolds, I'm going to turn over to you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Annabelle. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to have uh, Scott and Mark today. Uh, they're both at the University of Queensland in Australia. They both occupy a near legendary status in crop science, so not really a need for introductions, but just very briefly, I shall explain that Scott, he spans uh, many disciplines, physiology, phenotyping, genomics, and breeding, as well as uh, that across a number of cereals. And while Mark, he's pretty dangerous in those areas and adds quantitative expertise in quantitative genetics and experience of working in a major private breeding company. So I think we're in excellent hands today. And I turn it over to you, Scott, to talk for about 15 minutes. And then Mark will come in and, and talk uh, on the topic. Sorry, Scott will talk about uh, machine learning in phenomics and mark essentially machine learning in genomics. What I wanted to do was uh, just go through some brief applications of machine learning as related to crop growth modeling and, and more specifically phenotyping in fact. Uh, this is a, a quick uh, summary of some applications of these kinds of tools to look at genetic gain. It was put together by Jose Luisa Rouse and some colleagues from CIMIT. Um, and it was looking at how to translate high throughput phenotyping into genetic gain. And what we see in this diagram, you can look at it in more detail, is thinking about the steps of improving for genetic gain and trying to improve selection. Part of what we want to do is accelerate the amount of phenotyping that we can do and be able to map the field variability, but also to be able to parameterize models and understand how to predict performance in different environments. So you might be looking at prediction of performance in, in different um, production environments outside where you've done the testing. And, and Mark will likely be talking about some of that. So what I'm focusing on is thinking about how to, mainly about how do we improve the, the phenotyping steps. <clears throat> so one of the tools that we use to do that is Apsim, which is a cropping systems model. It's well established, it's been developed for 30 years, started in Australia with the University of Queensland CSIRO and Queensland government as core partners. And we use that in all kinds of applications in everything from developing drought policy through to applications around um, prediction of phenotypic performance. And we'll talk about some of that later. So crop models require, as most of you likely know, daily inputs of rainfall temperature and radiation data. Uh, they use soil, water and nitrogen characteristics as part of uh, parameterizing the model. And they keep account of all these growth variables, uh, leaf area, biomass, root size, yield. And you know, here's an example of an application where they're being used for um, prediction of system performance uh, that farmers might be using for um, making decisions about whether to add nitrogen, for example. And here's a general reference to a lot of that work that includes some discussions about our use of APSIM in genetic simulation. So what I thought I'd do today is take this physiological framework that I put together with Graham Hammer a few years ago, which is, this is a, a summary of what's inside the, the crop model library in, in APSIM and I'll just show some examples of how machine learning fits into this framework. Let me just turn on my little pointer. So stays here. Okay. So we have environment inputs. So this is weather data and it includes soil data as well. Uh, the gray things here are key parameters in the model, things related to leaf appearance rate, uh, extinction coefficient, that's capture of radiation. Use efficiency. So these are all 
fundamental, and these ones are related to water uptake. So this is about radiation capture. This is about water capture. These are key parameters that, for which we know there's genetic variability. And these are things that we're trying to get at when we're developing phenotyping methodologies in, in, uh, in breeding programs. And so what I wanted to do was couch some of the ML applications in the context of this diagram, which captures the, the physiology of, of how we get to grain yield uh, from these inputs and parameters and, and through these various steps, which I'll, I'll talk about during the talk. But really I wanna focus on things related to biomass accumulation. So the timing of phenology, the degree of canopy development that occurs and how we capture light and convert that to biomass. Here's a more generic table that I put together on how we might use machine learning and crop growth modeling. And there's quite a range of applications starting to go out. I didn't put together a whole lot of references on this. If you start searching for these, you'll find thousands of them. But the applications range from being able to infill and estimate weather data so that you can, you can get localized weather data for a given field. That's one of the initial applications and a lot of decision support tools now using that kind of information. Um, estimating soil characteristics. So for a lot of fields in the world and including in environments in Australia, we don't necessarily know what the soil type is in any particular part of the countryside. So we start to use machine learning methodologies combined with satellite imagery. So if we know what the soil types are, we sort of, we know what the soil types are and, the, and we have satellite imagery, we want to reverse calculate what the soil water conditions are. And we can start to use models to help us do that. Um, characterizing of stress, stress indices, again, we can use combinations of drones and satellite imagery to do that. And in fact, at the UQ, uh, we have uh, Andres Potgieter and, and Graham Hammer using that kind of methodology, mainly based around satellite imagery and weather records to, to do research on yield forecasting. And there are these couple of parameters here that I'm gonna focus on for the rest of the talk. How do we estimate these parameters that are in the, the crop models themselves um, and the types of data sources that we use for that. And some of the examples of things like estimating flowering time and genotype parameters for leaf area and in estimating parameters for grain organs and yield. We're also trying to work out things like head size, head counts, and part of the reason we want to do that is that in the case of sorghum, for example, we want to know how many tillers we've got because the number of tillers is correlated with the number of heads and the number of tillers that we have later in the season is influ influences our predictions of the leaf area. Uh, and we want to know that for, for running the model. And then the last point is interpretation of genetic basis of traits. And I'm going to leave that there because I think those are the kind of things Mark's going to cover in, in his talk. So here's a summary of one of millions of images you can get around deep learning methodologies. But this one's useful because it tends to separate machine learning and artificial intelligence. So one of the classifications that gets used for artificial intelligence is where you're trying to use computers to mimic human behavior. Uh, we're not using so much of that in, in our applications here, that kind of application starts to come into its own when you're thinking about decision-making algorithms. So if you're trying to develop tools that work across uh, full landscapes and you're trying to make decisions about how would I optimize um, productivity on my farm by making decisions and how would I optimize those decisions, then you're starting to use artificial intelligence approaches. In the things that we're interested in here, it's mainly related to machine learning and that's either supervised learning or unsupervised learning. So in unsupervised learning, there are some traditional techniques, which well used to be called statistics, but these days they seem to get called machine learning. But these are all traditional statistical methodologies. And we mainly use those to try to uh, partition and understand the data sets that we're working with. So these are fairly classical statistical methodologies that are essentially grouping and classification techniques. The techniques that we use in trying to do parameterization 
of models, or at least deriving some of these phenotypes, so things like counting the stands or counting the spikes, uh, estimating the, the ground cover or doing 3D reconstruction, more work in this area of supervised learning. So that involves collecting a lot of phenotypic data and usually has steps related to the need for labeling that data so that you can train the model to recognize, for example, wheat heads in, an, in a photo and being able to count those heads in a photo. And there's a, a range of techniques here. I'll mention a couple of them as I go through, but mainly talking about re regression and neural networks. So to go back to the crop model diagram, our main interest in this talk is really to think about how do we estimate some of these parameters in the model. So things related to leaf appearance and light interception and light use efficiency, uh, including the fraction of radiation that's intercepted by the crop at any stage of growth. So if we understand these parameters that drive the model, then we'll be able to derive um, the fraction of radiation intercepted and the crop growth rate and eventually the grain yield in any particular environment that we want to run a simulation for. But we can also take those simulations and, and use them to reverse calculate uh, parameters. And again, that's something Mark's going to cover, I think. So I'll focus on these two uh, parts of the table. And just to cover quickly a few aspects of how we might estimate some of this variability in, in phenotyping techniques in the field, um, measuring ground cover. Um, this is a very nice example here from some work from Fred Barre at INRA, where they were using hyperspectral camera, uh, sorry, uh, hemispherical photography to look at um, leaf cover in a corn crop that was under stress. So this is a photo taken in the morning and this is a photo taken in the same position in the afternoon when you can see that stress has occurred and, and the leaf rolling has happened and you can start to estimate that with um, drones, for example. I won't talk about it in detail, but there's a nice paper out from Fred Barre's team on that. Um, this is head, head counting in sorghum using methods that, that we might um, capture this imagery from from tractors and, and from drones. So this is the, the gecko tractor that we developed at UQ a few years ago. Um, it has um, ability to capture quite a bit of information. Uh, the main things that we're interested in here is um, imagery and LIDAR, um, as well as hyperspectral um, capture of information, that hyperspectral information can be used to 3D reconstruct um, crops and also to develop predictions of, of parameters based on quadrant sampling of those crops over time and then looking at estimation of biomass and, and therefore being able to derive the radiation use efficiency from crop cover and, and estimates of biomass. Uh, we also look at uh, temperature, we haven't been doing a lot of work with that, but we're starting to use um, temperature data to try to understand stress patterns in these crops as well. Uh, we also use um, phenocopter, um, well, I called it a phenocopter a few years ago, um, but we also use UAVs to start to look at crop cover and a lot of our crop cover and head counting can be done directly from UAVs these days uh, to, to get those kinds of parameters. So the types of things that we're trying to look at in, in the APSIM model, this is a diagram from a project that we're doing with, with Purdue, looking at um, biomass production in sorghum. And the things that we're trying to derive are the relationships between leaf area index and fraction of intercepted radiation. So the, the K, of the extinction coefficient in this curve, which can vary with genotype. So that's that 0.56 in this particular equation. But if we collect enough data on, on these types of um, contrasts, I mean, they're fairly extreme, I have to say, um, we can start to derive different values of K for um, different genotypes and then put that into the model. Uh, that's also related to 
the radiation use efficiency. So this is the grams per megajoule uh, of production. So if you look at shoot dry weight against uh, intercepted radiation over time, you can calculate this, this value. And one of the things we're attempting to do is use drones <coughs> and um, tractors to calculate how much light's been intercepted. So we're trying to estimate the amount of ground cover and light interception over time from imagery. And for shoot dry weight, we're also trying to estimate that in situ. So trying to use spectral, multi-spectral cameras and um, 3D reconstruction of canopies to estimate the standing biomass at different dates. So if you can estimate the biomass at, at several dates, and you can calculate how much light's been intercepted, which is the, the fraction of interception each day multiplied by the radiation recorded at a weather station, and you can create this um, relationship and estimate the regression that, that you need for RUE. So the machine learning really comes in mo mostly in trying to intercept, uh, estimate this intercepted radiation from, from imagery. Uh, you can also reconstruct the, the leaf size, leaf number profile for different genotypes. And again, uh, Mark might cover some of that uh, in this tool. So going through some of the methodologies that we use, I mean, uh, you can still use traditional statistical methods, um, very basic ones where here where this is some work with Andres Potgieter, uh, where we're using a multi-spectral camera to count plants. So this is a plot here, um, this blue here is a single plot. And with the multi-spectral camera, we've got enough um, ability to just use simple thresholding and count the plants as long as we fly them when the plants are small enough, we can, we can count the number of soil and plants in a plot with fairly degree of precision, just with with basic regression. So there's not really any machine learning involved in that. It's, it's pretty much straightforward processing, it's image processing and thresholding to, to do that kind of work. If you get into more complex situations, and again, Fred Beret's team have done this in France. Uh, if you're trying to count wheat plants, it becomes a lot more challenging. So they developed a methodology which uses uh, a combination of, of um, support vector machines um, and later on they've also used neural networks to improve this and what they've been doing with this imagery is they take oblique photos so these photos are taken at, a, at an angle from about a meter above the canopy and what they're doing is training the system to recognize the intersection of the plant stems with the ground so their analysis method essentially derives a line, which is the bottom of the plants hitting the ground or where they emerge from the ground, and then counting the intersections that occur along that image. And that way you can get an estimate of the plant density. Um, you've got to, of course, you've got to work out how to um, identify these objects. And in this process, they're, they're doing it through an erosion dilate, dil, dilation process. So. They, they start with the original image and then they peel it back until they end up with objects. And you, you have to label and train the system to do that kind of um, analysis. With this approach here, we're trying to count the heads and estimate this tiller number and, and leaf area. And if you go through the um, process that Fred has illustrated, we can measure biomass over time, accumulate this radiation over time and estimate the radiation use efficiency for different genotypes. And they've done that for wheat, for example. Um, and that allows them to integrate that crop reaction over time using leaf area models. I'm gonna skip that one. And just to summarize, um, we can use these models to, to estimate parameters for um, growth models through the season and grain organs and yield. And I guess in summary, I just wanted to um, point out that one of the, the utilities of using crop growth models is to, to use them to, to really make better decisions about how we use phenotyping information and how we use machine learning to estimate these crop parameters. So 
to put it in the context of how physiology works and how models work so that we can focus our efforts in, in the way that we use machine learning. So I'm going to leave it there um, with my acknowledgements. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the nice invitation and introduction. To follow on from Scott, he gave a really good overview of a lot of the methods that are in quite routine use um, in a lot of areas for um, measuring plant traits and trying to improve our ability to distinguish um, environmental situations, management situations, and genetic situations. So what I'm going to do is build on that and talk about this from the perspective of um, a, a great application of this capability um, that I've been involved in over a number of years with a lot of collaborators and um, that also includes Scott going back to the 1990s where a lot of the ideas behind this started to develop. And I'm going to talk about developing um, using the crop growth models with the capabilities to parameterize those models that Scott mentioned, the development of prediction-based methods for crop improvement with um, applications for um, the advances in genomic selection that we have today to accelerate genetic gain, but also integrating a lot of the capabilities that, that we have embedded in crop growth models to enhance some of those prediction algorithms and then also the ability to extend that once you've developed improved genetics to look at um, correct placement and understanding genotype by management by environment interactions, to look at the potential um, to realize the uh, improvements from breeding through uh, accelerated reductions in gap analysis on farm. So what I'll start off with is a general picture here um, of a breeding program. It's really intended as a schematic that has basic elements, your germplasm population um, from where the genetic variation is being um, used by breeders, an understanding of your target population environments. And then I'll focus a lot on um, the bringing together of a lot of the information on genetics, environment, and the expression of phenotypes in these multi-environment trials that we run and that we build up over many years of running these breeding programs over many stages um, to create this large data resource um, where we can do meta-analyses to implement some of the ideas that Scott talked about. And that then enables our ability to to develop our prediction algorithms. And what we're interested in is predicting the breeding value of the individuals that we're creating so we can turn over cycles of the breeding program. But we're also interested in predicting genotypic value and phenotypes of individuals that have been created to predict their expected performance in the target population environments. Ultimately, what we're interested in doing is looking at opportunities around this breeding program cycle with the basic breeders equation, where I is your um, ability to select with a defined level of intensity, some measure of predictive accuracy from whatever model you build to the target that you're trying to predict to and an understanding of the genetic variation and how quickly you can turn over this cycle to look at ways in which we can model a current breeding strategy and then to improve on that. So what I'm going to do is um, talk about this intersection here and think about these multi-environment trials where a lot of the genetic information comes together with environmental information to study trait phenotypes as Scott um, um, really well explained to us. And what we're actually interested in is building this up as our training data resource for building the types of models for prediction. So think about the breeding program basically becoming a generator of your training populations so that you can actually uh, predict further. Um, obviously, um, we're interested in better understanding these environmental variables as Scott talked about. And here's an example of work that um, was done in partnership with colleagues Charlie Messina and his team at Corteva AgriScience, where we were characterizing um, using a lot of environmental variables, soil characteristics, weather variables, um, imputing those and building up an overall 
geographical and um, temporal view of the different types of environments that we encounter. And then we could actually go into any one of these locations and look at a lot of the types of information that Scott was talking about and our ability to parameterize crop models for traits such as the radiation use efficiency parameter Scott was talking about. Um, one of the ways we try to integrate all of this information is instead of dealing with every environment on every day and every year is to try and condense it using classification systems where we would actually condense this down to dominant environment types which measure the uh, likelihood of a stress occurring during growth and development around flowering time. Um, and here we're just looking at the water supply demand index where an index close to one indicates you run into um, very little water stress, whereas a high index that's um, where the value is decreasing around flowering time indicates you've run into a water deficit. This allows us to better understand our environment types within the target population environments. At the same time, we're fingerprinting all of the genetics in this breeding program to get at the underlying genetic information. And then this becomes our source of environmental information, our um, genetic fingerprints, the molecular markers, to start to build um, predictors of these phenotypes using the predictors from the um, molecular markers, SNPs, in combination with the environmental variables. And there's, there are many, many ways to do this. And what we're actually interested in doing then is building these models so that we can actually start to use them for prediction. And there are many types of predictions we're interested in in a breeding program. We may be taking the genotypes that have been created by a breeding program and predicting their performance across this target population of environments. Or alternatively, there may be specific types of environments we're interested in, such as a drought environment, where we're trying to predict the performance of all the other genotypes we could have um, selected in the breeding program based on their molecular marker fingerprints and predicting how we expect them to perform. And then ultimately bringing both of these together so that we look at how our breeding program cycle could actually create and predict the performance of new genotypes for these different types of environments. So we basically have um, built a lot of these models around this um, breeder's equation where we've now, we're in a position to start to evaluate how well this is working where we don't have too many problems with genotype by environment interaction. These training data sets work very well and we can actually get pretty good estimates of this predictive accuracy um, component here for a range of traits from relatively high to even moderately low levels of heritability. However, the problem starts to occur when we have genotype by environment interaction where a training set may not be a very good representation of the targets we're going after. And these types of situations where predictions from these types of models are actually not only uncorrelated, but negatively correlated with what we actually observe are a consequence of dealing with this full complexity of genotype by environment interaction in this, this whole system. And so we're, we're actually interested in using the crop growth model to help us to do a better job in this. So if we could parameterize a crop growth model as dis discussed by Scott and connect those parameters he was talking about to the, the, the sequence um, variation at this level, we could actually adjust the average effects of these alleles and um, to do a better job of predicting to the wider range of environments. And so in this situation where we actually embedded a crop growth model um, into this prediction framework, we could actually adjust, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, adjust these average effects of allele substitution. So these are the predictors that we're actually using, these environmental variables, the sequence polymorphisms that we can measure using the crop growth model as a component of, of the prediction algorithms. And so in this case, for that particular, the same data set, when we replaced some of our standard prediction algorithms, by embedding the parameterized crop growth model in the prediction algorithm, we could actually do a better job of predicting for that same environment the actual observed yield. And so we actually turned this 
negative cor cor correlation around to um, a positive correlation. And so what we're ultimately interested in doing is for a wider range of the environments and these different types of environments is moving from the situation where some of our standard prediction algorithms do a relatively poor job. So this predictive accuracy here is what we're measuring on both of these axes where we have a zero predictive accuracy or even a negative predictive accuracy. We're actually using the crop growth model embedded within the prediction algorithm to adjust the average effects of allele substitution to translate this now into positive predictive accuracies. And so that was a theoretical example. This is an example taken from the breeding program, the maize breeding program that I was actually operating at that time, where we were trying to predict that these different environment types, these different um, dots represent predictions to different environment types in this case, where if we use the standard algorithms, the crop growth model parameterized um, enabled us to adjust and actually move from poor predictive accuracy to positive predictive accuracy that we could then run inside the breeding program. So this sort of helps us with all of these types of predictions here. And then, as I mentioned, once we've actually created the genetics out of a breeding program pipeline, we wanted to extend these predictions so we could actually look at predicting across a wider range of environments. So what we've done now is we've actually extended the prediction using the inputs, the variables that Scott was talking about, the soil types, the weather variables, the different management strategies from a large um, sample of locations and years across the Corn Belt to run that same prediction model for those genetics and actually look at the expected variation in grain yield that we would expect for all those different genetics in these different environments under different management regimes and then looking at the amount of water that was actually consumed. So here we're actually looking at the about over half a billion um, simulations for a whole range of genetics from the breeding program across this target population of environments and building a heat map up of the range of yields for the amount of water that's actually consumed in these different management scenarios. So this then builds up an overall um, state space view of the genotype by environment by management system we're working within. And then we've got some idea of the targets and then we can actually go to any particular experiment, look at the yield for the genetics that was actually realized and start to look at prediction algorithms that would allow us to identify management genetics and genotype by management combinations to move this particular um, realization into far better situations and better use of the water resource. So what we're actually doing, um, and as um, this community is well aware, is we're using um, crop growth models, this hierarchical structure. So instead of connecting our polymorphisms, our genetics, to the endpoint trait yield, we're using this hierarchical structure. So as well as parameterizing these traits in the models, using the different um, artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms that Scott talked about. We're connecting those, those polymorphisms to the traits and using the crop growth model as an integrator of that information to do the yield prediction for us. So the processing of what we would call big data, which starts off um, from all these different sources, we're actually building these crop growth model gene to phenotype models for the target traits for the elite genetics and breeding programs to enable this um, prediction process. So really, when this, what this looks like experimentally, you've got this view of your target population environments. We're running these multi-environment trial experiments. These experiments are done with a high level of um, um, understanding to create different environment types. So we can separate out genetics that are tolerant and susceptible to different types of stresses that we're interested in. And so the framework is um, around this crop growth model. We're using these hierarchical Bayesian algorithms with all of these parameterized models to look at relating the traits within the crop growth model to the, the SNPs and then the average effects of allele substitution for these SNPs to actually enable this um, prediction. The, just to finalize, 
Um, the final point on this is this has already been implemented for maize and it's actually driven the production of commercial hybrids that are grown on millions of hectares across the US Corn Belt and they've grown in other countries as well now. The next challenge that we're actually working on is um, as well as the teams um, within Corteva AgroSciences that we worked with extending this work for maize, we're now working um, with a number of other um, teams around the world to extend this and transfer it to other crops. And so one of the main crops that we've started to work on there through the work at the University of Queensland with Scott, Graham Hammer and others at the University of Queensland is transferring this capability into sorghum to, to demonstrate how this can be used in a wider range of situations. So I'll leave it at that. And um, thank you very much for your attention and time. And I'll stop there and hand it back to moderators. Thanks very much, uh, both of you. Very useful talk. I mean, I learned a lot today, so it's always nice, particularly in the pandemic. And you have lots of time to think about. Um, when I've been looking at these technologies or techniques in any sector, I mean, in medicine, in pesticides, in those kind of developments, there's pending a lot of interest because you can automatize certain things. If you have enough information in the background, you can try different combinations. So if you look at the mapping that, let's say, our gene banks here have done on the genetic side, how big do you see possibility there to come in, in the near future that we could play around and say if you have this combination of genes and then you can use machine learning and, and other techniques to play around with that a bit to have I don't know a couple of million iterations and put a perfect crop or a crop that is perfectly suited to the stress and then evaluate that with the models and maybe at some point get to a real farm. Do you see that somewhere in the future or what's the potential there? So, so if I understood the question, you're really interested in whether or not we can actually more effectively um, um, work with germplasm resources to evaluate the novelty of the genetic variation for traits or, or even create some new traits we might be interested in using um, um, in applications, um, in breeding and sort of on-farm deployment of uh, genetic resources. I, I, in, in that space, I yeah. think we're actually progressing in that direction. Um, the one thing that I would say to this community is that I, I think that crop growth models are actually going to be central for um, a lot of the application of many of these ideas to practice um, in the future. So I think that instead of um, sort of having a large gap between the ideas from evaluating germplasm where you might end up with some traits and idiotypes that have to be evaluated by breeding programs. I think some of these modeling capabilities are going to allow us to do some really detailed evaluation of whether they're bringing novel genetic diversity and the ease with which novel alleles might actually be able to be used inside a breeding program. And that becomes really important when you consider that breeding programs are actually shifting allele frequencies over many cycles. And when you're bringing in new genetic diversity into a breeding program from a germplasm bank, if they start off as relatively low frequency rare alleles, they've basically got to work against and a lot of other alleles that are already well proven inside the germplasm this gives you an ability to actually understand the value they can bring and what frequency they need to be at before that value could be realized in a breeding program. So there are some great opportunities in this space, I think, um, Kai. So you know, I think the crop growth model is, is really a central integrator that this community should be thinking very um, carefully about how to develop those so that they can work with the, the genetic variation going forward. Let's just uh, wind up then. I mean, Mark asked a question. I think that one of the one of the angles that our community is taking now at the beginning, because this started in 2017, 
we're just trying to get things going. But now we're looking at how, because it's a big data platform, we're looking at how we can make more data generally available for modeling purposes. Uh, because at the moment it's a small fraction of what's a, what could be available is model friendly. So that's where remote sensing comes in, for sure to estimate hydration status, nitrogen status, but let's see what more we can do. Okay, guys, I think we better wrap it up here. Uh, it's been a real pleasure and uh, we've learned a lot. I'm sure that uh, the community will be glad. You probably get a lot of questions uh, after the uh, conference. Thanks a lot to, to Mark and Scott. Really, really informative and lots of food for thought, I think, for the community. And for further discussions, um, it will all come live at the Big Data Convention, so I hope everybody can have a look there. Uh, it will be a bit tricky, but maybe we'll reach a wider audience this time because it's not going to be in a specific location with travels involved, but will be available to anybody in the world who's interested in crop modeling and context of big data. So many thanks. Hope to see you there in some way or the other. And good evening and good morning to everybody. <laughs>